now we're starting with the networking session because there is uh, no IoT without the networking part. And we have three really nice uh, talks for the networking session. We are going to start with a remote uh, talk from Sam Kumar from University of California, Berkeley. He's a PhD student uh, there working on uh, security networking and to rethink systems to you know, overcome the overhead of uh, security for low power devices. And uh, today he's going to talk about uh, performant uh, implementation of TCP uh, for low power uh, wireless networks. He did a in-depth study and uh, performance analysis on that. Uh, he's going to tell, tell us a bit about that and shows that uh, yeah, TCP also belongs to the constrained IoT world. So uh, Kumar, uh, can you say something? Can, you, can we listen to you? All right. Um... Uh, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, as you said, uh, I'm Sam. Uh, I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley. And I'm going to tell you about some research work I did on performant TCP for low power wireless networks. This is joint work with Michael Anderson, Hyungsen Kim, and David Culler, also with UC Berkeley. Uh, this research was published uh, a couple of years ago now at NSDA 2020, and we were really excited to be awarded the Applied Networking Research Prize from the IRTF for our work. So um, I'm going to begin this talk by giving some background on a brief history of research uh, in low power wireless personal area networks or low pans. And for this audience, I recognize that some of you are probably experts in low pans, particularly in the networking session. But I'm going to give this brief history to help out some of those who may be new to the area, but also uh, to give some context so that you can understand exactly how we believe our work fits into the overall research. So research on low pants began in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And at this point in time, researchers deliberately cast away the internet architecture based on the idea that low pants might be too different from regular networks for the internet architecture to be applicable. So this allowed the really early systems in the space, like SMAC, BMAC, TinyOS, and Kentucky, and the rest of the systems here that were all very widely influential. It allowed them to directly tackle the challenges of low pants without being constrained by having to fit into an architecture. About 10 years later in 2008, IP, the internet protocol was introduced in low pans. And what happened here uh, is that this was largely introduced by the six low pan layer. And this allowed the researchers to find ways to take the techniques that were developed in the earlier systems that didn't conform to any standard or architecture and make those techniques work within an IP based architecture. Uh, so this caught on, and in a few years, IP had essentially become the standard in the space. But surprisingly, the adoption of IP did not include TCP. For example, OpenThread, um, a network stack open sourced and released by Nest, didn't even support TCP. And Riot OS initially didn't support TCP either. Now it does, but when I was looking at uh, Riot OS early on in the research, it didn't support TCP back then. And instead, the direction the community went in was to build application-specific protocols on top of UDP, often based on or, or enabled by, by protocols like CoAP. Now, it's worth noting that to this day, there still isn't wide adoption of low-pen technology to bring internet connectivity to, uh, to embedded devices, at least not on the same scale as we have seen in other wireless protocols like Wi-Fi, which is pretty much ubiquitous these days. And a natural question is whether the next step toward getting that kind of wide adoption for low pens is to use not only IP, but also TCP in the broader set of IP-based protocols. So in that context, our work completes the transition of low pens to an IP-based architecture by showing how to make TCP work well. And TCP LP over here, that's a research artifact a full uh, performant TCP implementation for low power wireless networks. So what do I mean by performant? Well, one metric is good put, which is the amount of bandwidth that an application is able to get on top of a TCP connection. Now, there have been a few prior attempts to run TCP in this space, typically based on simplified embedded TCP stacks like micro IP or blip. And these are also shown here in the diagram. Uh, and our work, TCP-LP, achieved significantly higher good put than this prior work. 
Uh, in fact, we can calculate a theoretical upper bound on good put based on how fast the radio can send out packets, the overheads of headers and acts and so on. And our work comes quite close to this upper bound. Uh, now, since we published our work, uh, OpenThread, which I mentioned earlier, is an open source low band stack used by some products in the smart home space, uh, open sourced by Nest, recently added support for TCP. And in fact, it uses our work, TCP LP, as a TCP implementation. And our research significantly influenced the thread network standard, which OpenThread implements. Um, I was fortunate to have been invited to help spearhead this process. And I'm hopeful that the adoption of TCP will help low pan technology more broadly uh, to gain adoption. So with that preview out of the way, I'm going to take a step back and talk a little more about what low pens are. And this is mostly for people who are familiar with this. I recognize that some of you in the audience are probably experts, uh, but, uh, but I felt it's good to give some grounding on what low pens are quickly. So you can understand low pens by comparing them with other networks that you're more familiar with. Uh, so Wi-Fi is, provides a host of internet connectivity via an access point. Bluetooth uh, is a lower cost and lower power solution than Wi-Fi, but doesn't really provide true internet connectivity. It's more of a, a cable replacement channel or a wireless USB of sorts. And in contrast to these, a low pen aims to provide connectivity like Wi-Fi to various embedded devices and operates at an even more extreme cost and power point uh, compared to uh, Bluetooth. So low pens have been used for a variety of applications like environmental monitoring and structural monitoring and so on. And recently there's been a push to integrate them into the smart home and IoT space. Uh, but while low pens are really useful, uh, they also come with a set of challenges. Okay, so uh, these challenges range from the resource constraints, link layer constraints, and energy constraints. Resource constraints mostly from the fact that we're operating on hosts with limited CPU and RAM, the kind of devices you would run an operating system like Riot on. Um, the link layer constraints include the fact that we have a small MTU of only a few uh, of only about 100 bytes, really, uh, and low wireless range that requires us to use multiple wireless hops to bring internet connectivity to devices. And the energy constraints really manifest in the form of having to duty cycle our radio. Now, what that means is that we need to keep our radio off in a low power sleep stage for like 99% of the time. And only 1% of the time, for example, we can turn on our radio and send and receive packets. And what that means is that we need some careful scheduling at the link layer in order to make sure that our radio is on and listening when packets are sent to us. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, the adoption of IP in this space did not include TCP, and that was no accident. Uh, researchers in the low band space have deliberately avoided using TCP due to a set of concerns about how TCP would perform in this space. And here on this slide, I have a few quotes in order to demonstrate what some of those concerns were. Uh, for example, some people think that TCP is not lightweight and may not be suitable for implementation in low cost sensor nodes with limited processing memory and energy. Uh, the idea that TCP is a connection-oriented protocol makes it a poor match for wireless sensor networks, where the actual data may only be in the order of a few bytes. And finally, there's the classic wireless TCP problem, the observation that TCP uses a single packet draw to infer that the network is congested, and this can result in extremely poor transport performance because wireless links tend to exhibit relatively high packet loss rates. So to summarize that, you know, there's a perception that TCP might be too heavyweight uh, for use on resource constrained uh, low pan nodes. Now, there's a perception that TCP's features sometimes are necessary in the space and bring additional overhead. And finally, the wireless TCP problem. Okay, so what we did in our research is we actually ran TCP in a low pan to see whether these expected reasons actually apply. Um, and what we found uh, is that Initially out of the box, TCP indeed performs poorly, but not for these expected reasons. Okay, the actual reasons were somewhat different. What we observed is that, you know, the, the, the small layer two frame size of only about hundred bytes of low pens results in high header overhead, which eats away at your good butt. We found that hidden terminals are a serious problem when transferring data over TCP over multiple wireless hops. And finally, that uh, TCP can really interact poorly with the link layer scheduling needed to maintain a low duty cycle. Now, initially, this would not seem like a big deal. You know, 
as I said, out of the box, TCP performed poorly, but not due to the expected reasons. But it turns out that the reasons themselves are actually really important here. The reasons on the left, if they were to exist, would be fundamental reasons. You can't really work around those, uh, those reasons for poor performance easily. Whereas the reasons on the right are actually fixable via fairly straightforward techniques within the paradigm of TCP. So in our research, we show why the reasons on the left don't actually apply. We show how to address the actual reasons that we observe for poor performance on the right. And our overall conclusion is that TCP can perform well in low pans after all. Now, in addressing the reasons on the right, we had to develop a set of techniques uh, in order to cope with some of the challenges of running TCP that directly address the three main challenges of low pans that I mentioned earlier, resource constraints, link layer constraints, and energy constraints. We have a list of reasons here, and as I go to the talk, I'll, I'll call out when I'm going to talk about some of these. Uh, in this time slot of just half an hour, I won't have time to go into all of them, but, uh, but I'll point out the ones that I do, and I'm happy to answer about the others in Q&A, or you can go take a look at the paper if you're really interested. So, um, so that's an overview. In the next part of the talk, I'm going to talk about why the expected reasons for poor TCP performance don't apply. And as part of that, I'll talk about the TCP implementation it will cause me to, to address some of the buffering uh, constraints, to, in particular, this in-place reassembly queue technique. But the focus of the section isn't on these techniques per se. It's really on broadly our observations about why the expected reasons for poor performance didn't apply. So our experimental methodology uh, was to use sensor nodes based on the Hamilton platform that we developed in our research lab that's based on the Atmel SAMR21 system on chip. Uh, with 32 kilobytes of RAM and using an ARM Cortex M0 Plus processor. Um, and what we did is we used Riot OS, but we didn't use the GNRC network stack for our experiments. Instead, we used the open thread network stack running on top of Riot OS. So we used Riot OS for timer management, CPU management, and so on, but we used open thread network stack to form, uh, uh, to, to form a network topology, uh, as you can see here in our wireless testbed. Uh, and also to handle all of the networking. So um, in our uh, in our wireless testbed, we had several sensor nodes. And this is an example topology that OpenThread might come up with. Um, and we ran TCP within one of these uh, between each of these nodes and a Linux TCP endpoint hosted in the cloud. So the TCP connection traversed our border router, went over the internet uh, to an endpoint in the cloud. Um, to implement TCP. Uh, you know, there have been a few prior attempts to run TCP in the space, space of simplified embedded TCPs text. But for our study, we wanted a full scale TCP implementation with all the bells and whistles you would see uh, for a non embedded platform uh, like Linux or FreeBSD or Windows or something. Uh, however, you know, building a full scale TCP implementation is a very significant undertaking. In fact, there's, a, there's an RFC from 1999 listing the numerous bugs in TCP implementations over the years, and this was after TCP had already had a decade to mature. Um, so um, we didn't want to undertake something that significant. Uh, so our approach was to start with the mature full-scale TCP implementation in FreeBSD and re-engineer key parts of it for the embedded platform. And our idea here was to get the best of both worlds. We want the code base that is somewhat adapted to the embedded platform so its resource usage wouldn't be overly high. But we were hoping that by beginning with the mature TCP implementation, we'd avoid a lot of the bugs and implementation problems that, that we typically see uh, in, um, in full-scale TCP implementations as they mature. And a resulting implementation is TCP LP, where the LP stands for low power. So now that we have an implementation of TCP, we can actually validate whether TCP is too heavy or not. What we found is that it requires 32 kilobytes of code memory and half a kilobyte of data memory per connection for the connection state. And this fits comfortably within the available ROM and RAM of our sensor platform. Um, there's some optimizations here. For example, we use a separate structure for active sockets that are actually TCP endpoints and passive sockets that are used to listen for connections so we can avoid using a half a kilobyte just for a socket used to listen for incoming TCP connections. Okay, so this is the deal for connection state. You know, a natural question is, what about the TCP buffers, right? How much memory do we need for the buffers? Um, and 
Uh, this is really dependent on the bandwidth delay product. We need enough of a buffer in TCP in order to accommodate the product of the bandwidth we're able to achieve and the round trip time of the connection. And we empirically measure this to be about two to three kilobytes, where we, you know, we modify the buffer size and observe how the good foot behaves in response to that. Uh, now, I want to point out here that the buffers, it turns out, are actually much bigger than the TCP connection state. Okay, you know, it fits comfortably in memory, uh, despite that, of course, but it's much bigger than the TCP connection state. And what that said, so what that means is that you know these large buffers would be needed for any bulk transfer protocol. Uh, in this space, right? You need enough, regardless of your protocol, to fit the bandwidth delay product. And what that suggests is that, you know, I say it fits in memory, but even if it were a problem, right? The complexity of TCP as a protocol would have nothing to do with the memory problems, right? Uh, the memory usage is dominated by the buffers, not the connection state or the complexity of the protocol itself. Uh, so that was an interesting observation here. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about buffering. Uh, it's that uh, in a full-scale implementation like FreeBSD, you know, you have a structure like mbuffs to represent uh, buffered memory in the network, and you implement all of your buffering, your send buffer, receive buffer, and reassembly queue as chains of these mbuff structures. But on an embedded platform, we didn't want to do that because there's always a chance that you exhaust your heap uh, with these dynamically allocated buffer structures, and instead we opted for flat circular buffers allocated statically. And an ideal strategy there would be to use a separate buffer for the receive queue and the reassembly queue. Uh, now it turns out we can do significantly better based on our observation of how the advertised window size relates to the amount of buffer data. In particular, this is a receive buffer here. You know, there's always this relationship, which is that you know the receive the reassembly queue can never exceed the advertised window size. Yet the advertised window size plus a number of received bytes is equal to the size of the received queue. Okay, so while we logically have two buffers here, this observation allows us to use a single fixed size array for both the received queue and the reassembly queue. And the way that works is like this. Uh, we have our in-sequence data in yellow, where we use a circular buffer to keep track of which bytes contain the in-sequence data. That is our received queue. And then for reassembly queue, we just use the other bytes in the same array outside of the bounds of the circular buffer, right? So we're out of order data in this example is red, data that we've received out of sequence. And we can use a bitmap to keep track of which bytes contain out of order data, which, uh, which is much less memory than maintaining a separate array of the same size to store our data received out of order. So this allows us to save a significant amount of memory. So usually when I give this talk, this is all I have to say about implementation, but given that I'm giving this talk to the Riot Summit, I thought it would be good to talk a little bit about Riot's GNRC stack. So as I mentioned earlier, most of our results, uh, or essentially all of our results are based on using the Riot OS for CPU management and timers and so on, but using OpenThread for the actual network stack. But earlier on in the project, we did do some work implementing TCP directly for Tiny OS and Riot's GNRC, and I wanted to speak a little bit to that experience here. You know, in GNRC, you know, each thread handles one layer of the network stack, and each thread has a message queue holding packets waiting to be processed at each layer. Uh, and a natural approach then to run TCP is to run TCP in a thread using Riot's X timer utility to handle TCP timeouts. Okay, so just to show that visually, you have a thread, and inside that you have a message queue. Um, and when an X timer expires, you know that the callback that executes an interrupt context, that'll add an event to the message queue. So you have this X timer, it expires in an interrupt context, it'll go and put the timer expiry event into the free slot in the message queue. Okay, so so far, uh, that's just a summary of how GNRC works and how you do what you might implement TCP in a pretty straightforward way. It turns out that there is one problem here. It's that, you know, what do you do if the queue is full, right? So in the previous slide, I had a free slot here, but now I have packets filling the entire queue. And the problem that happens here is that, you know, X timer drops the message because it's an interrupt context. It cannot block waiting for space to become available. So it'll just drop the timer expiry message. Uh, and now, you know, if you drop a packet, that's fine because the network is designed to be resilient to packets being lost. But the TCP code is not resilient to the timer being lost. If you lose the timer, then the callback never gets executed. And the way the, these callbacks work in FreeBSD is that 
when you have a periodic timer, like a weird transmission timer, the timer gets reset in the callback. So if you miss one callback, you miss the whole chain of retransmissions uh, that, that would happen. Uh, so our solution here is to use a separate thread for TCP timers. Uh, and we make that work using tiny OS-like semantics for actually tracking when timers are pending. So the way this works is that this TCP timer thread has a message queue, but it also stores this array of pending timers. Um, so when the X timer expires now, what we do is we first go and mark the, the timer as being pending uh, in the interrupt context callback. And then we go and we put the timer expiry event in the message queue. Okay, so because only timer expiry events go in the message queue, we can be sure that the timer expiry event won't be dropped unless there are other timer expiry events. And what I mean when I say we use tiny OS like task semantics is that a single timer expiry event is processed by the thread by scanning the entire array of pending timers and handling all timers that are outstanding. So if we so if our message queue is somehow full of timer expiry events and we drop the new timer expiry event, that actually doesn't matter because in the course of processing the ones that are currently on the queue, we will scan the entire pending timers array uh, and make sure that all the outstanding timers, including the one that just got dropped, will be processed in the thread. So that this is kind of an interesting conclusion that we came to in terms of how to implement that we needed a separate thread for TCP timers. And potentially in the future, I guess, you know, if Riot OS were to implement some kind of priority system for the message queue or allow some way to reserve a slot for a timer expiry event, that could potentially allow this design to be consolidated into a single TCP thread, allowing for robust timer processing and also packet handling. Now, I also want to say a little bit about, you know, comparison of overall TCP performance. Um, one interesting thing that we noticed is that open thread uh, is nearly 20% faster than GNRC for handling TCP traffic. And this is just in the common case where you take two of these Hamilton sensor nodes, put them a few meters apart and transfer data over TCP directly between them without you know, any intermediate hops or anything like that. Um, and 20% you know, isn't a huge difference. You know, If you compare it to what the state of the art was in terms of, you know, uh, the existing simplified TCP stacks, you know, Riot and GNRC is still far faster than, you know, some of the straw men that we compared to earlier on, but 20% is something that we did investigate, and it seemed like it was really the structure of the network stack, the thread per layer architecture, that seemed to have something to do with this. And, then as, and I just say this because if you look at the classical systems architecture uh, research outside of the embedded space, there have, there have been some observations that, you know, asynchronous communication between network layers, you know, in the form of, you know, transferring packets from one layer to the other, similar to what Riot does, has been observed to lead to some performance problems. And it's just a question whether that might explain some of these observations. I just wanted to put that other to start a discussion. Uh, and there's some more discussion in Appendix A of our paper. I'm happy to, to discuss this more in the Q&A if there's interest. Uh, and I want to point out that, you know, the Trepper layer thing has advantages in terms of modularity and so on. So I'm not saying this is a bad idea. I mean, it may very well be worth it. It's just worth noting that, it, that it, there is a bit of a performance discrepancy as a result of that. Okay, so back to the, so back to TCP performance. You know, at this point, I want to address the wireless TCP problem. Uh, and that really has to do with how many in-flight TCP segments uh, that we have. Uh, so the bandwidth delay part, as I mentioned earlier, is about two to three kilobytes. For reasons I'll talk about later, we size each TCP segment to 250 bytes to 500 bytes. And this was chosen carefully based on issues regarding link layer fragmentation and so on. But the overall outcome of this is that we have four to 12 in-flight TCP segments, and that's far smaller than we typically see for TCP, right? In a non-embedded uh, network, something that isn't a low pan. Um, we, uh, you, we typically see far more in-flight TCP segments than this. And it turns out that having only four to 12 in-flight TCP segments profoundly impacts how TCP's congestion control operates. So if you look at how TCP new unit performs in a low band, you can get a graph like this, where we have drawn the congestion window together with the BDP. And what's happening here is that TCP is experiencing losses pretty frequently but it's able to recover to a full BDP very quickly. And as a result, it spends most of its time actually operating at a full window. 
Now, there's a more challenging setting we can look at. This is one where we choose a smaller MSS uh, and we use random early detection and explicit finishing notification, which will induce additional losses. And then we get a graph that looks like this, where you know here it takes longer to recover to a full window after each loss. But regardless, TCP still spends a significant amount of time operating at a full uh, at a full bandwidth delay product. So our overall conclusion here is that you know because our bandwidth of these networks is uh, is pretty small, the condition window is able to recover to a bandwidth to the full bandwidth delay product pretty quickly, and as a result. TCP in a low pan ends up being more resilient to wireless losses because you recover more quickly after each loss and end up spending a significant amount of time transmitting at a full window. This is kind of a counterintuitive result, but, it's a, but it suggests that the wireless TCP problem may not be nearly as serious as some folks feared it might be. Okay, in the next part of the talk, I'm gonna address the actual reasons for poor TCP performance. Um, and here I'm gonna talk about two techniques, the atypical maximum segment size, uh, and a delay that we introduce as a link layer. So here's a comparison of the maximum transmission unit uh, of TCP and, and these various link technologies. And the key point here is that TCP IP headers are insignificant in the context of Ethernet or Wi-Fi, but not in the context of IEEE 802.15.4, which is a low pan link layer. Typically, we size TCP segments to be as large as the link layer supports, but no larger. This is the standard in Ethernet or Wi Fi where you have 1500 byte MTU, and over IPv4, you have about a 1460 byte uh, maximum segment size where 40 bytes are, uh, are used for the IP and TCP headers. But in IEEE Interduda 15.4, we only have 104 byte MTU, and if you were to do this, you will see a very significant header overhead. Uh, sometimes even exceeding half of the overall space we have due to TCP options and, and so on. Um, instead, our approach is to give up this assumption that that's typically used and instead allow TCP segments to span multiple link layer frames, relying on the six low-pan adaptation layer for fragmentation and reassembly. So there's a trade-off here. If we make uh, if we make our segments too small, we have the header overhead problem that I mentioned earlier. But if you make it too big, then we're relying a lot on six load pan and losing a single frame of a segment would cause the entire segment to be lost. So we get this kind of loss amplification effect. So we empirically measure what would be a good trade-off. And we found that you know three to five frames uh, of an MSS uh, is pretty good at amortizing the header overhead. And you know which particular MSS you use could also be informed by the loss rate. Because if you expect a, a particularly high loss rate, choosing a smaller MSS is probably better because remember the loss amplification. If you lose one frame in a segment, you lose the entire segment. Um, I wanna also point out that stateful TCP header compression could is entirely orthogonal to this and could potentially result in even greater gains. Okay, I wanna say a few words about multiple wireless hops before I go to the conclusion. Uh, you know, in an, overall no, in an overall network, for example, spanning a smart home, you might have some links that go between a battery power node and a wall power node. Um, and you might have other links uh, that, uh, that go between different wall power nodes. Okay, uh, so for the, B, for the B to W here, the battery power node to the wall power node, um, we use a technique called adaptive duty cycle to make TCP work well with the duty cycling protocols. And unfortunately, we don't have time to get into that. But one thing that we did observe is that between the wall powered nodes, we see a significant packet loss rate due to hidden terminals. Okay, and I'll briefly explain what hidden terminals are. You know, given the wireless range of a node, you know, you can imagine its range as being a circle. And in practice, the circle is, is this assumption that we call the unit disk model. You know, in practice, the wireless range is a whole lot more complex, but the circle is good enough for to explain hidden terminals. Okay, and a hidden terminal problem to understand, and imagine you have a set of nodes in a row and their wireless ranges might look something like this. And when you transmit two segments uh, along the same path, what ends up happening is that you know these two nodes, I mean, I mean these two segments tend to interfere intermediate nodes. Like for example, B is within listening range of both of these. Now we typically don't use RTS CDS type protocols like you would see in Wi-Fi due to the small MTU. Instead, we just typically use CSMA CA. So what happens is that A is out of range of C. So A CSMA doesn't detect C's transmission. 
C is out of range of A. So C's CSMA doesn't detect A's transmission, but B is able to hear both and the two packets may collide at B. And this is what I mean when I say hidden terminals cause increased packet loss. Uh, the same occurs with segments and acts going in opposite directions, where in this case, the two packets are going to interfere at C. Okay, so to mitigate this, our approach is to say that if a transmission fails, which we detect by the absence of a link layer act, we wait a random amount before we try. Now, this is different from CSMA. Right here, uh, even if the channel appears clear, we're going to add a delay. In contrast to CSMA, which only adds a delay if the channel appears busy. And furthermore, we choose a long delay, 10 times the time to transmit a frame. The idea being that if two nodes independently and randomly choose their delay, they should be far enough apart that the two frames won't collide. Okay, so what will happen with this protocol? Well, the two packets may collide once, but then after that, we'll wait a random delay before retransmitting, at which point, hopefully, the packets will become standard due to the randomness and will no longer collide. Okay, and with this, we observe that if we, if we vary the maximum link delay on the x-axis, we can observe the implications for segment loss and good foot. And we found that around 40 milliseconds works pretty well in terms of reducing the segment loss rate significantly without affecting the good foot too much. Uh, and here, we're able to reduce the packet loss rate from 6% down to 1%. Okay, so now I'll say some words about our evaluation and some conclusions. So as I said before, uh, we significantly outperform prior work and achieve within 25% of a reasonable upper bound with headers. That is comparing this bar here to that bar there. We also study TCP's energy efficiency, uh, where we use TCP and COAP for a sense and send task and measure the radio duty cycle over a 24 hour period. What we found is that TCP does not have a significantly higher radio duty cycle than a protocol like COAP, in this case, they both have a rate of duty cycle around 2%. Um, so now that TCP is a viable option, what does that mean for network systems in the space? Well, first, I think that we should reconsider the use of lightweight protocols that emulate part of TCP's functionality. Uh, in cases uh, where uh, TCP performs well or almost as well as these alternatives, we should just go ahead and use TCP because it's better for interoperability and is more widely deployed. Second, uh, I think that uh, TCP may influence the design of low pen network systems. Uh, in particular, uh, the currently popular is, an, is using this gateway-based architecture idea where you have an application layer gateway at the edge of the network performing application-specific processing to bring connectivity. Uh, instead, using TCP end-to-end -end would let us replace this with a plain border router and improving interoperability between different vendors' ecosystems. And finally, just to talk a little bit about UDP, we think that UDP protocols will still be used in low pants, but the role will be more similar to UDP's role in the rest of the internet, uh, where you know we use TCP in the common case and rely on UDP only in special yeah. cases where applications uh, substantially, where the specialized protocols will substantially outperform TCP. Yeah. So that's all I have prepared. Uh, in summary, we implement TCP LP. We explain why these reasons for poor performance don't apply. We show how to address the actual reasons for poor TCP performance, and we show that once the issues are resolved, TCP performs comparably to low band specialized protocols. So um, thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take questions now. Okay. Okay, thank you, Sam. I think we have time for maybe one or two quick questions. We have yeah. Michael. Michael has a question. Yeah. Sorry. Someone said in chat asked about six tish, and I also was curious to know whether you had done this with any um, time slotted channel hopping to deal with um, the hidden terminal problem instead of the back off the, the, the delay. Yeah. So, uh, so that's a great question. Uh, we used Open Thread, which uh, which doesn't use tish. Uh, it it. It just relies on CSMA, which is why we added the delay. Um, and the and also the reason why I didn't talk about the the um, the protocol between battery powered nodes and, and the and the wall powered nodes is because uh, that's based on listen after CERN protocol that OpenThread uses. But to my knowledge, Riot OS doesn't really use that. Um, now it's it's true that if you have a protocol like Tish to handle hidden terminals for you, 
the additional delays that we added a link layer may not be necessary and Tish might just work, but we never actually, actually did that experiment. So that would be good to investigate. Okay. More comment than a question. So I'm a team, uh, I wrote you in a scene. <laughs> Um, actually, the uh, problems you pointed out in TC with TCP in GNSC actually also showed up in NetIf, and there we found the solution to use the event API, which uh, came in later than GNSC, which is actually one of the reasons why it's multi-threaded, because that was basically the only API to handle such events at that point in time. Um, so maybe going to this event API might be also a good idea for the timers in the upper layers. And maybe even having the event API as a backend for the API, just one thread, would also help with the performance. Uh, this, that's an interesting thought. So um, I'm actually not familiar with Riot's event API. Maybe that's something I should look into. Um, it's also it also might be the case that the event API didn't exist in its current form back when I looked into TCP over Riot because that was several years ago, around 2016, uh, before Riot had merged in its current TCP implementation. By the way, uh, but that's an interesting thought, and I'm happy to see that that Riot might have evolved in a way to alleviate some of the issues uh, th 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 that I mentioned in the talk. Okay, thank you. And uh, yeah, for the sake of time, I think we should move on. We thank again our speaker. Yeah, uh, and thanks again for the opportunity to present here. I really appreciated it. Thank you. Thank you a lot.